Hi, uh, good afternoon. So I'm Mandy Rose. I'm the director of uh, uh, University of the West of England's Digital Cultures Research Centre, and I'm part of the group who've curated this academic strand, with, also with Benko from Microsoft, with some distinguished speech, speakers from around the world. Um, where is VR taking us? So um, among other things we've heard um, from those speakers from Mel Slater this morning about the plasticity of mind that can mean that VR experiences can, can give you a changed sense of self. We've been hearing from Benko just now about some of the kind of illusions that you can perform as a producer in VR. Um, so I guess what we're turning to now is what those, what those issues raise, those issues of, the, of VR's power raise for producers and researchers in terms of our responsibilities to users in those VR experiences. Um, so I'm going to welcome Michael Maddery, who's a researcher from the University of Mainz, who works on uh, the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of perception, and whose book, Visual um, Epistemology, Phenomenology is available now from MIT Press, but he also, Michael also works on the ethics of emerging technology and around February 2016 um, published with um, Thomas Metzinger a piece of work called The First Code of Ethics uh, for VR, uh, looking at both research and entertainment. Um, so we're really thrilled that Michael could join us this afternoon and talk through that work, in particular how it applies in the entertainment context. Um, and um, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, the, my topic today will be the ethics of virtual reality. I guess I should say from the beginning that um, I know there's been some discussion of terminology in here. Um, I, I'm going to use the term virtual reality, but I should probably uh, or th th think of uh, immersive technology more generally. So I mean to include augmented reality and mixed reality and whatever else, uh, whatever other kinds of immersion we might imagine. Um, here, here's an image of the uh, of the code of conduct. As you heard, it was published um, published in February of last year in uh, Frontiers in Robotics <clears throat> and AI. So if you if you're interested in what I'm saying today, I encourage you to to, to look up the article. Um, we published it, and we, we tried to cover, uh, we, you know, we tried to think of uh, all the possible ethical risks that might arise with the development of new technology. Now, of course, that's an impossible task. Uh, we know that, and we know it's just a start. Uh, but because of this pro because of this task, the paper became very long, and uh, <laughs> and and nobody has time to read long papers anymore. So we put a we, we put our recommendations at the end in a table. So if you if you are interested and you don't have time for the whole paper, we have our our, our, our table of recommendations at the end. Uh, here's the structure of my talk today. Uh, first, I'll ask why should we care about this? I'll try to answer, uh, try to motivate these the, the, these issues. Then I'll ask why is VR different? Why is it different than uh, than other media? And finally, I'll get to the recommendations. What should we do about it? So those are the that, that's the general structure, threefold structure of the talk. And first, why should we care? Um, I'll give you two answers to this question. The first answer uh, is an old answer from Aristotle, uh, because everyone wants to have a good life. It's, there's this idea from classical philosophy that uh, when, when humans act rationally, we're, we're, when, we, when we perform actions, we do them because we think that in some way they'll bring about the good. And this is a, the first line of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, sort of a classic work in, in moral philosophy. Um, every art and every inquiry, and similarly, every action and every intention is thought to aim at some good. And the term, the art is, is the, the, the Greek is translated into art there, but the original Greek is techne, where we get our technology from. So uh, Aristotle was doing philosophy of technology way back many years ago. Um, but uh, I think this is, a wor th th this is a worthwhile point to make because, uh, you know, it, in, in developed societies, there's a drive for innovation, there's a drive for, for, for creating new technologies, and uh, there's not always the, the, the question of why. Uh, is, this, what, you know, is this going to be good? Is this going to help with human flourishing? How will it help with human flourishing? 
And uh, I think it's I think it's important just to just to ask that question to say, you know, why are we doing this? Is it is it just for the sake of innovation? Is it just for the sake of something new because we can do it? Or do we have a clear idea about how this will help us as human beings? Now, if you uh, if you th if you disagree with everything I've just said about this slide, and you say, "What's this Aristotle stuff? This guy's crazy." Then I'll give you a second answer to the question that you might <laughs> that you might like. Um, 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 why should we care? Well, uh, if you don't buy the line about Aristotle, you should care because you want VR to succeed. Um, uh, if if you want this to be a to be successful, so um, as William did earlier today, I think maybe we can. Uh, gain some insight by looking back into the last time we developed a new uh, mass medium. This is a, a clip from the film Night Nurse from 1931. Ethics, ethics, ethics. That's all I've heard since I've been in this business. Isn't there any humanity in it? Ethics, ethics, ethics. Um, so in, in particular, I want to focus on a period of cinema from <clears throat> uh, in the early 1930s in Hollywood where uh, there was a lot of experimentation, there were a lot of topics being explored in the films that were, uh, that, that were uh, controversial at the time. So here's, here's one of the most controversial films, uh, is from 1933, Barbara Stanwyck again, in Babyface, where she plays a, a, a woman who sort of uses sex to, to sleep her way to the top, to, to gain power. And um, at the time, this is, you know, this is frowned upon by, by the, uh, by, by, uh, by members of society. There's a bit of an outcry. Uh, another example is The Public Enemy from 1931, where, uh, you know, the violence of the gangster life is portrayed, in some sense is glorified. Um, there's, a, there's the movie, the, the film uh, uh, Freaks from around that time, where the, 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 the poster for that is, is actually, I think, I think it may be too offensive to, to show, so I didn't I didn't put the movie F Freaks in there. That's another one where even today, what goes on in that in that movie, um, I think uh, some may find some may find offensive. So they're sort of pushing the boundaries with this new art, um, and there was a backlash. So here's a, a the cover page from a book published in 1934. Uh, summaries of studies from the Pain Foundation. These massive sociological studies as to viewing habits of uh, of Americans, especially viewing habits of children, questions about how often they go to the cinema, questions about whether it affects their sleep, whether it affects their behavior. So we have a new technology, we have a new form of storytelling, um, and we have scientific questions. What does it do to us? Will it harm us? Um, and, you know, there are some interesting questions about the scientific validity of these studies, but the scientific results were used in order to uh, uh, drive this outcry against what was coming out of Hollywood in the 1930s, early 1930s, led to the enforcement of a code, the Hayes Code, for governing the making of motion pictures. Um, and in some form or another, this enforcement of the code lasted from the early 1930s to the uh, to late 1960s, when when the, uh, a new code was was developed. But for that period, there has to be approval of the content. So there was. Uh, you know, for much of the 20th century, some form of censorship um, on films, on motion pictures. And it happened because as the technology developed, people started, people started experimenting. Of course, there are a lot of interesting causal factors in there, uh, but there was a backlash, and the backlash led to some form of censorship. So uh, the point then in, in this the second answer to the first question of the talk is that I think we should uh, expect that the general public will be concerned about the psychological impact of immersive technology. Um, just anecdotally, going, you know, telling people I'm interested in VR, I'm working on VR, uh, many people say, oh, that's kind of scary. What, what's going to happen with that? Where, where is that going to go? And I, I think, uh, you know, if we wanted to thrive, if we wanted to progress, if we wanted to be free uh, uh, to create great content, then you know, now is the time to start, start thinking about responsibility, to start thinking about how people will perceive it, um, and to do it in an empirically based way, which is what we try to do in the Code of Conduct. Okay, the second question, why is VR different? 
Well, it's different because it creates strong illusions that are unlike those found in other media, illusions of place, embodiment, and agency. Mel Slater talked about illusions of embodiment earlier today. I'll say a, a, a few things about those. Um, I'll also comment on the illusion of place and the illusion of agency. But before I go into those three particular illusions, I want to uh, just uh, ma make a quick point about um, our value of what happens in virtual worlds. So some, you know, some members of the, you know, some, some members of the general public may say, uh, uh, "Well, you know." It's just virtual reality. It's just a digital world. What does that really does that really matter to us? Is that really important? Is that something we have to think about in terms of ethics? Uh, there's a story I, I like to tell from uh, 2006. Uh, a Chinese gamer uh, named Caillou Cheng Wai. He was playing a game uh, called Legends of Mir 3, an MMORPG called Legends of Mir 3. Um, put a lot of time and effort into the game, and his friend, in both in real life and in the game, lived, he lived in Beijing with him. So these guys, you know, they go into the game, play together. Uh, Caillou earned a dragon saber in the game, really powerful weapon. You know, it took him hours and hours of play to, to, to earn a dragon saber, made him very powerful in the game. Well, his friend said, hey, Caillou, can I use your dragon saber, please? Will you lend it to me? I wanna, I wanna, I wanna use it, I wanna destroy some uh, enemies. Uh, and Caillou said, okay, you can do it. Uh, yeah, I'll give it to you in the game, but you must give it back to me. So he gave it to him in the game. Instead of giving it back, his friend sold the sword on eBay for about eight, the equivalent of about 800 euros. Um, so he, he didn't, uh, he, he betrayed Caillou Cheng Wai, which is you know, a pretty rotten thing to do. Um, but then the story turns tragic. Caillou went to the police and said, this guy stole my virtual sword. And the police said, we, there's no law against that. There's no sword there. You know, it's a, it's a virtual object. Uh, so Caillou took the law into his own hands and murdered his friend. He stabbed his friend to death. And now he's, he's serving life in prison. So uh, what happens in the virtual environment does matter to us. It does translate into real world consequences and it does translate into financial consequences. There's also, you know, the, and, and there are many uh, other tragic stories of gamers being uh, so, so immersed in their games that they become enraged when they're interrupted um, and they lose control and in and, and cases when they're supposed to be taking care of children, the children have been injured or killed. So, uh, so you know, the, there does seem to be something different uh, about immersion in a virtual world. And, and, and these cases aren't even, you know, full, aren't even, uh, uh, virtual reality type immersion. This is just playing on a two-dimensional screen. So it does seem to affect us. It does seem to have some kind of, uh, some kind of an impact. But let's get away from the two-dimensional screen and say, what's different about virtual reality? Virtual reality creates the place illusion. You all may, you all, you all, many of you know what I'm talking about. It gives you the strong feeling of being somewhere else. Uh, and in the, in the literature from psychology, there's a classic example of the place illusion, or there's a classic experiment that illustrates the place illusion, where uh, uh, a wooden board is put across the, the floor of the, of the laboratory. The subject puts on a head-mounted display and is, and is instructed with a simple task of walking across the wooden board. Now, when the subject puts on the head-mounted display, what she sees is... Uh, a wooden board, but not on the floor of a laboratory, a wooden board across a very deep pit. Um, and, then, and then, you know, the challenge is to walk across when, you, when you're experiencing this place illusion, you're experiencing this illusion of being in, da you know, being in danger. Be, you know, if you walk off the board, you'll, 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 fall, you'll fall down. Uh, I had, at, at a conference last year, I, I had the opportunity to uh, ex experience a variation on the... Um, on the place illusion, uh, this is this is uh, a reproduction of the wire walker, a, a, a wire walk across the from one uh, uh, World Trade Center tower to the other um, in the 1970s, when that went you know before they b b before they fell. And uh, in order to create that illusion, you know, it, it's not a wooden board, but what was used was just a cord taped to the ground, and um, 
and I, you know, I, I went into it saying, come on, this isn't going to be that bad. But I, I, I was terrified. I really couldn't do it. I, uh, you know, my heart started racing. My knees started shaking. I had a difficult time with it. And the way I got across was by breaking the illusion. I, I, I remembered that, you know, I'm wearing these things. I remember that I have, you know, students and colleagues behind me watching me. And I said, well, I have to, <laughs> I have to make it across. Um, uh, so I broke the illusion. I deliberately stepped off of the, of the, of the wire, the artificial wire, in order to sort of reassure myself or uh, reinforce the belief that I'm not, uh, 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 reinforce the belief that I am, in fact, safe. Um, and, and that's, you know, that, that sort of came out in earlier talks, I think, uh, today, that that's one thing that's, that's, that's fascinating from a psychological perspective, from the philosophy of mind, about immersive technology, and that's um, that it creates this strange situation where we feel as if we're somewhere else, yet we maintain the true belief that we're not somewhere else. We react emotionally, physiologically, as if we are where the VR tells us we are. But we maintain this belief that says, no, you're not. You know, it's not a, it's not a cognitive illusion, as, as Mel Slater said, uh, said, said earlier today. So it creates the illusion of place, or the place illusion. The second one is the illusion of embodiment, which we heard about also a bit today from from uh, Mel Slater's presentation. Uh, he gave some great examples, so I don't, I don't really have to go into the details. Uh, but uh, just to sort of emphasize this point he made that um, you know, we take it for granted that we have a, uh, an accurate relationship with our own body, that the, the body that we feel as if the, the, to be ours, to be in our control, um, is a fragile relationship, in fact. It can be tricked very easily. And, and, and you know, the classic example of that is the, uh, of such a trick, a low-tech trick for, for giving an illusion of embodiment is the rubber hand illusion, which many of you heard about today. So if you have a rubber hand placed in a biologically plausible position, and the hand, and you see the rubber hand being stroked in synchrony with your own hand being stroked in the same way, in the same place, you'll feel a sense of ownership for the rubber hand. Um, if we can do it on a hand, we can also try to do it on a body. This is a, a, an, a, an experiment. Uh, the article was published in 2007 where uh, it's, it's you know, relatively low tech, where the participants are wearing a head-mounted display, and what they see is the back of their own body. So you, the, the camera is set up behind the subject, and then the camera is fed into the head-mounted display. The output of the camera is fed back into the, he into the head-mounted display. So what you see when you're wearing it is you see your own body, say, uh, two meters in front of you in space. And then to get the tactile, um, the tactile stimulation, just instead of brushing the hand, like in the rubber hand illusion, you brush the torso. And they have a sort of quasi-out-of-body experience. It breaks this fragile relationship that we have towards our own bodies. Again, uh, some, some, some of Mel's work from earlier that when you, uh, you know, he's experimented with putting people into uh, darker skinned avatars, giving them, first they give, he gives them uh, an implicit racial bias test, which is, which is an association test, then puts them into a darker skinned avatar in virtual reality for about 10 minutes and gives them the implicit racial bias test afterwards and his experiments are successful. He's able to, uh, he's able to decrease the implicit racial bias. This is something uh, that we, Mel mentioned, but we didn't talk about it, or he, he didn't talk about it very much today. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's largely unexplored in, in, in the realm of virtual reality. I think there's going to be a lot of exciting experiments uh, in the future. An illusion of agency. So the illusion of embodiment that I just talked about is this uh, this illusion of owning a body that's not yours, whether that's a rubber hand or an avatar or whatever. The illusion of, a the illusion of agency is the illusion of performing an act, uh, of being in control of an action or of performing an action that in fact you really did not perform. It's the agency there is illusory. Your sense of agency is an illusion. Uh, and, and if you think about it, it's fairly, I think, um, it, it can be a bit shocking to think that, that that sort of thing can go wrong, and that it can go wrong fairly easily. Here's a classic uh, uh, experiment on illusions of agency from uh, Daniel uh, Wagner from 1999, where um, 
he used he, he was inspired by I, I don't know if you have these uh, this board game here to speak with the occult uh, Ouija boards. We have them in the United States. I don't know if they, I don't know if you're familiar with them. He was sort of inspired with inspired by the Ouija board, where he said you know he he said you know you're not uh, from his scientific perspective. I don't know if, I don't know if you. Uh, believe this stuff, but from his perspective, he said, of course, you're not really communicating with the dead. Uh, it, what happens is that you, you experience an illusion of agency. When two people, you know, there's an alphabet on the board and you ask, you ask a question to someone who is, who, is, uh, who is dead, and then you're supposed to be communicating with them as the board, sli as, as the board slides around, or, or sort of as the platform slides around the board. And his hypothesis is that we are moving it, you know, when you play with someone, you put your, both put your hands on the platform, you are in fact moving it, but you're experiencing an illusion of agency. You think the other, you think, you think it's, it's the, you know, a message from the beyond that's, that's actually moving it. So he tried to reconstruct this. He, he created something like a platform from, from a Ouija board, but he, uh, he wired it into, he, into a mouse for a desktop. And the task was uh, uh, to, uh, well, this is the, say the subject is on the left, and the task was just to move the mouse around, click on an icon, and then report afterwards whether you felt as if you were the agent, whether you felt as if you were controlling the cursor for clicking on that icon. And then what he did, and, and the person on the right was a confederate, was the person on the right was just receiving instructions from the experimenters saying, you know, take control of the board, take control of the mouse now and click here, uh, click on this particular icon. He gave auditory cues to the subject to sort of influence their thinking. So if, you know, if, the, if, if, the, if, if the cursor was going to eventually line up, uh, you know, line up on, a, on a pigeon, he would, he would give an auditory cue of bird to the subject. So they'd start thinking about bird, and then the other person would take control of the cursor and click on the pigeon. In these cases, very often, he, he was able to create an illusion of agency. So just by making the subjects think, you know, start to think about birds, then lose control of the cursor, and the cursor clicks on the icon, they feel as if they did that. They feel a strong sense of control and agency for doing that. Um, now, of course, this is an experimental setting, uh, but I strongly suspect this will be very easy to do in virtual reality. Um, and once, you have owner, once you experience ownership of your avatar, uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, we just saw in the previous talk, in Benko's talk, that, that these, you know, small illusions about where, uh, uh, where, where you move and whether the lines up with where your avatar moves, that can be, that can be done. So uh, we can think about creating an illusion of agency in virtual reality where, you know, say you cho you're choosing between, you know, say you're doing some online shopping in virtual reality and you're trying to choose between the, the, the more expensive or the less expensive and they're right next to one another and you... Uh, you know, the strong illusion, you know, if the avatar is moved in the right way and maybe if all the conditions are correct, you could have an illusion of, experience an illusion of picking out something, uh, you know, seeing your avatar pick it, pick it out. The avatar wasn't really copying the way your body was moving, but your brain says, oh, I, yeah, I guess I did that. I, I, I feel a sense of agency to that, for that. I feel that I was in control of that. So I think that's something, uh, that's something to worry about. Okay, what should we do? This is the third part of the talk. General answer is we should approach technological innovation in an ethical and responsible manner. It kind of gets back to the point from, from Aristotle earlier. Is this bringing about the good, or is it just innovation for the sake of innovation? Uh, you know, start to reflect on responsibility, start to respect, uh, reflect on uh, effects. Um, now, one one thing I think that an initial and important point to make is that we know from, psych from uh, social psychology that our environment can have a strong influence on our behavior. We already heard about the Milgram obedience experiments this morning, the well-known Stanford prison experiment where when students at Stanford University were told to role play either as, uh, either as prisoners or as guards in the prison. And the experiment had to be shut down after just a couple of days because they took their role playing so seriously that the situation escalated, and it, it, you know there was there was worries that it may become violent. Um, and you know that that's an example where you're in an environment, you're playing a role, and you sort of get too much into it. You start to play the role uh, fully um, and behave in ways that you wouldn't ordinarily behave. The Ash conformity experiment is another. It's another nice one where. Um, 
you're given a simple matching test. You know, they say, we're going to give you an eye test. Uh, you know, match, so they'll show you one line, and then they'll show you three other lines, A, B, or C, and say, which one matches the length? It's a simple test. You should be able to do it. But the trick is... You're, the test is conducted in a room with other subjects in the experiment. They're not really subjects. They've been instructed, they've all been instructed to give the wrong answer to the test. So, so the, you know, they go around the room, you, you look at the test, you, you form your judgment, but then they ask everyone else in the room, what's the right answer? And they, they all give the wrong answer. Uh, and then many people conform. Many people just give in and, you know, they say what they know or that what they perceive to be wrong because of their environment, because of perceived social pressure. Uh, the last one is, is a nice point because it's, it's a ni nice experiment, not as well known, but it shows just how small environmental manipulations can change our behavior. Um, it was done in, you know, in, in a university break room where there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a little coffee bar and it's a, there's an honesty jar there. So you're supposed to put in as much money as coffee you drink. Uh, uh, you're supposed to be honest about it. If you drink more coffee, you put in more money. Um, uh, in the control condition, there was a neutral picture put above the honesty jar. It was like a, a house or a flower. And then they record how much money was put into the jar at that time. In the experimental condition, uh, the scientists just put a pair of eyes, a picture of a pair of eyes above the jar looking at, looking at people. And when the pair of eyes were there, people donated three times as much money to the honesty jar. Um, small environmental manipulation, but it changed their behavior. Well, why is that relevant for us? Why are these re results from social psychology relevant for us? Um, well, because virtual reality creates a situation in which the entire environment is created by someone else, created and maintained by someone else. Uh, and and it, it just opens up vast opportunities, I think, you know, based on this kind of evidence, it opens up opportunities for targeted behavioral manipulation. So I think users should be made aware that there's evidence that, that, that experiences in VR can have a lasting influence on in behavior after leaving the virtual environment. These are just the, res you know, these are the results from the last few years from Mel Slater's lab, from Jeremy Balenson's lab in Stanford. Um, users should be made aware that we don't yet know the effects of long-term immersion. There's been no, there's, you know, there are no studies on this sort of thing. People are doing it, people are trying it out, uh, but you know, the, there, there's no scientific result about, about what it might do to us. Um, we should conduct further research into the lasting effects of long-term immersion, and we should foster communication between researchers and content creators. That's something that I think uh, would be very fruitful for virtual reality to have this kind of discussion between the academic research and the, the industry and the, and, the, and the content creation. Um, but even that further research, you know, it, it, it's not really enough because we should also keep in mind that the research itself is going to be constrained where the most vulnerable users may be excluded from the study. So if you, you know, if there there are selection criteria, if you if you show signs of having perhaps say latent latent mental illness, they're not going to do the studies on you because you'll be excluded for ethical reasons. But it's it's kind of a trick situation because it's precisely those people who may be at most risk for uh, for, for psychological uh, trauma from from immersive extreme immersive experiences. Children as well. Very very little research on how. Uh, the, on how immersive technology affects children. They have a difficult time at some age you know, telling reality from, from fiction. Uh, we might speculate that if healthy adults had these kinds of effects that, that Mel Slater is finding in his lab, then we might suspect reasonably that younger children would have even, you know, even further, would be even further influenced in their behavior by what goes on in the virtual world. Um, We'll have, we'll have the ability to create avatars, to, uh, to claim avatars as our own. We'll have strong illusions of embodiment. And, but remember, an illusion of embodiment is a feeling of as if this avatar is me. Um, and, you know, of course, that's going to be a lot of fun. I think many of you are probably excited about that. I'm excited about experimenting with this sort of thing. Uh, but let's, you know, if you use your imagination a bit, these experiments could turn uh, dark. Um, we should warn users about the psychological effects of body swapping, using avatars of the dead. So, you know, I think you know, some ex experts on grieving should weigh in and say, well, 
would it be a good idea to 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 create an avatar of someone and then you know uh, when they die to interact with that avatar as part of the grieving process i don't know that you know that's, that's an open question for psychology uh, of course virtual sex and virtual violence when we, if we have you know users are going to have the ability to create avatars that look like whoever they want to they'll be able to animate those avatars however they want to um, and you know they may use it to to, to satisfy some of their uh, sexual desires or you know desires for revenge and violence or what have you uh, there's another great talk this morning about social interaction with immersive technology. I think that's that's very exciting. That's going to be one of the obvious directions for the uh, for the technology. Um, but I'm worried if we start to replace in-person contact. This is a study published uh, two years ago, uh, based in the United States, a survey of older adults in the United States. And what was found in the study is that there's a correlation between lack of in-person in contact, in-the-flesh contact, social contact with others, correlated with a greater risk of depression in older adults. Uh, and interestingly, they, you know, they looked into whether other forms of contact uh, uh, through, 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 you know, through, through other media had an effect. And they said, no, it, it doesn't seem to help. So you know, telephone calls, emails, even old-fashioned paper letters, none of that helps. What seems to matter for this increased risk of depression is actual in-the-flesh interaction. Now, could VR overcome that? If we, you know, could, could we trick the mind so powerfully that this kind of psychological need for being with someone, uh, being together in the same space as someone, could be overcome? I don't know. Uh, I don't even know. You know, I don't even have an explanation for this study. You know, why is it? What is it about us? That we crave, or, you know, that, that it's so so important for our psychological health to be present with other people. But the uh, the results are there. It seems to be important for us, and so we have to be careful when we start to uh, replace, you know, increasingly replace in the flesh interaction with others. Body tracking is going to be very big. It's going to be very important. It's going to enhance our experiences. So we should explore ways in which bodily signals enhance the technology. We can, we'll be able to read subtle emotional cues through facial tracking and so on. But the flip side of this is that if we do so, then you know, if we allow our, face, our faces to be tracked, our bodies to be tracked, then, of course, it runs the risk of revealing much about ourselves. So it's, there's a risk of privacy. I don't know who gets, ri who gets rich on, um, on, on using private data. But, uh, I've heard people do that. And, um, and, and, and but what's different? You might say, you know, okay, we, ha we already have privacy. How is this different? Well, what's different about it is that, you know, right now the, the, we're, we're revealing uh, keystroke, you know, uh, mouse clicks and keystrokes, and maybe we'll upload a photo or a video of ourselves. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of results from, psych from, from, from social, uh, I'm sorry, from embodied cognition and psychology suggest that uh, we express ourselves a lot through our bodies, through our facial expressions, it's really important for human interaction to uh, you know to have this sort of this form of exp of self-expression. We reveal a lot about our minds through our bodies and through our faces. So you know um, the privacy issue uh, will be magnified in in cases of body tracking and facial tracking because. Um, we may be revealing things about ourselves that we don't even realize. I mean, subtle facial movements may, may indicate that we're interested in something. You know, how long we look at something, our, our gaze and so on, how long we look at something may, may, may indicate aversion or interest. And this is all information that then you would be sharing to marketers or to, to you know, whoever, whatever purpose they want to use this information for. Um, we should, of course, use immersive technology for journalism. Uh, for, for documentary filmmaking. There's been a lot of excitement about that, a lot of great work done with that. Uh, but then we have to ask then, what, you know, are, are there risks there? What should we be careful about with that sort of project? Um, I think there might be a risk that we, we, we give the illusion that immersive journalism will tell the whole story about a complex situation. Uh, you have to choose, you know, I, I guess just, just with, with traditional filmmaking, you have to choose a point of view. Um, and that's a very careful and important choice sometimes. So if you choose a point of view, users might have the experience of saying, you know, 
I, you know, I know what's going on in Syria. I was there. I saw it for myself through this fantastic immersive documentary. Well, yeah, that's great, but you know, it's a very complex situation, and you had one point of view on that situation. So, um, I think there's th there's a risk of, of of sort of overplaying one's hand of saying that this is you know this is really going to um, uh, 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 th this really tells the whole story. You know, if you if you just had this one experience, this tells the whole story, and you can walk away being you know saying I feel like I was there, so I know a lot more about it. And I think th I think that's something uh, to be careful about. Okay, to sum up, um, we should expect controversy as virtual reality as immersive technology grows. We see it we see it historically from other media. VR is no different uh, in, in that respect to traditional forms of media, uh, but VR, on the other hand, is unlike uh, existing media in important ways. It can create these illusions that other technology just cannot do. Um, and finally, uh, I suggest to you that it's time to focus on ethical innovation. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Really, uh, really important and very interesting. And I, I hope there's time for a couple of questions before we move on. So are there hands up? I can't really see from here. Yes, there's one back there. Rob, somebody passed that man a mic. Um, Um, here's, um, here's a question for you. Where do you stand with something like, um, you know, Facebook with their VR for good? So here is um, a project um, where let's use VR to fundraise. Wonderful. We'll change the world. We'll have people, you know, feel empathy, the big buzzword of last year. Yeah. Um, we'll have everyone kind of immersed, and then at the end they're going to donate money, um, and it's going to help change the world and help change charities. But where do you stand ethically in, in the sense of this kind of being emotionally manipulative, that at the end, you know, the, the goal is to have people, you know, hand over their money, and it gives people the illusion that, oh, I've given freely, but actually you've just been manipulated through yeah. the last three minutes of being in this, this uh, experience. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, uh, so in, in, in applied ethics, there are the simultaneous principles. We're supposed to respect beneficence on one hand and autonomy on the other hand. And there are very few, are very, you know, there are common cases in which those, those conflict with one another. So I think, I think that might be a really nice example of that kind of conflict. You might say the, the, the ultimate result of, uh, of this activity is beneficent. We end up making people feel more empathy. We, make, we end up making people, uh, you know, raising, raising money for these, for these organizations. But on the other hand, it is manipulative. You're not allowing people the sort of, uh, uh, you know, self-determination of who they are, what they feel, and so on. So, it, you know, so it, it's, a classic, it's a classic dilemma that we have. And one, I mean, one way around it, I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the details, but the best way around it, I think, would be to, to conduct it in a way that uh, is deliberately respectful of autonomy. So, you know, and, 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 and I kind of hinted at that in, in some of the slides, this idea of being honest with users up front, telling them what we know and what we don't know, telling them, you know, this is a powerful experience. The goal of giving you this experience is to increase empathy. Is this something you would like to do? So I think, you know, trying to balance those two is, is, is ideal. And, and, you know, there are, there are other cases in, in, in applied ethics where, where those two come into conflict. So I think I would frame it uh, with something like that. Anyone else? Yep. David Crawford from Ravensbourne. Uh, somebody once described VR to me as electronic LSD. So if we take that as a level, and you started first of all talking a little about uh, in the cinema, the way things, uh, yeah, there had to be a body that, uh, that, that looked into the ethics of the uh, productions, the content for the cinema, etc. Do you think we'll end up, like drugs, having A-class, B-class, C-class, VR <laughs> content production? How, how could it be controlled? Right, right. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, I, I suspect that there will be a call for a rating system. Um, and... and 
uh, and so r right now, you know, the initial the initial attempts are we say, well, we have a video game rating system board. Let's just use that existing system uh, for VR, maybe with some tweaks. But uh, what we can do with the technology, I think, you know, it, it, it's not just video games. It's it's something different. It's a new kind of illusion. So uh, I suspect that uh, a rating system. I, mean, I I wouldn't recommend making them illegal like like the drugs. Uh, but but I, but I think an informed rating uh, rating system, uh, you know. That involves this kind of open communication I'm calling for between content creators and the and the scientific and psych psychological research would be ideal. That that's the sort of thing I'm encouraging. I can't predict whether or not that will happen. Can I see? Uh, so what, what, perhaps one last question. Then is that William? Your arm? Yeah. Up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, one of the conditions that's attended the rise of VR is globalization. And we now have, and, and a lot of our ethics, a lot of what shows up in your code of ethics, is kind of Western-centric in notions of autonomy, notions of, mm. of privacy. Uh, other parts of the world have other ways to configure those, it seems. And, and so a question, what, with transnational corporations, with transnational development in this space, transnational product flow, is there, how do we deal with that sort of multicultural mm. dimension of ethics? Whose ethics reign? Right, right. Uh, Western, of course. No, I'm not, not going to get away with that. Um, uh, that, that. That's a great question. I mean, I think uh, we have to. Well, you know, we, we have to we, we have to begin somewhere, and uh, we have to work with the traditions we have. Uh, so I think that was. I guess we were sort of, you know, unashamedly bringing bringing the applied ethics from the Western philosophical tradition into this in, in, into this uh, arena. Um, I think it, it would be fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it begins the dialogue, and then it'll be fascinating to say, well, let's look at, at at cultural situations in which in which there may be opposition, there may be less value for autonomy or less value for beneficence. Uh, uh, I, I I don't know. I'm speculating, but. Then you know. Then the dialogue proceeds from there. I think that I think that's the best we can do. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, the alternative would be sort of just a full-blown relativism, and then you can't even get started with that. So, so you, st you start you start from a tradition, you start from a perspective, and then you try to have uh, a fruitful dialogue about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say thanks, and I'm going to say. Um, yeah, that, that perhaps that your, your, your proposition that we lean towards thinking about the autonomy of the user in VR is, is rather a good, a good place to start. Respect for the user and for their autonomy. So thanks so much, Michael. And um, yeah, five minutes, I think, till the next session. Okay.